Put God first. Your presence in their lives gives them validation. Our children don't need us to be superheroes. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. Men, stand up, be fathers. Hey guys, it's Mark, your host and founder of The Inspired Legacy. If you're new here, this is the show that seeks to equip and inspire you to unleash your inner lion and reveal your true purpose as spiritual leaders in your home. Well, unless you've been living under a rock the past decade or more, I think it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that we're living in a very confused culture right now, and I think that's probably putting it mildly. And as a result, men in our society, I think especially impressionable young men, We're being shown a very distorted view of what it means to be a good, righteous, noble man. I believe that we were made for more than what the world has to show us, and my guest today certainly does as well. I'm joined by the great Stephen Mansfield. He is a New York Times bestselling author of The Faith of George W. Bush, The Faith of Barack Obama, Lincoln's Battle with God, The Character and Greatness of Winston Churchill, among many others. And as a listener to this podcast, you guys might be familiar with a couple of his other books, Manfield's Book of Manly Men and Building Your Band of Brothers. But today he's here to talk about his latest book, Men on Fire, Restoring the Forces that Forge Noble Manhood. Stephen, it is a privilege to have you on the show today. Welcome, sir. Mark, you're very kind. It's great to be with you, buddy. Right off the bat, I've got to say I'm a little upset with myself for not having you on the show sooner because the, <laughs> the, the contributions that you've made to the larger efforts of you know speaking into the hearts of men, efforts that I and I think so many others strive for as well, you've made such a huge impact, especially with this latest book. So thank you uh, right off the bat. Well, thank you. It's a privilege, really. And you know, you're not only keeping the ball rolling with this latest book, Men on Fire, but Man, you've raised the bar to the next level. And so what I'm about to say, guys, listening to this, I do not say lightly, but I truly believe, having read this book almost entirely, I'm I'm just finishing it up, but I truly believe that outside of the actual Bible, this might be the single best step-by-step guide I've run across in a long time when it comes to living life on purpose, with focus, and with passion. It is just phenomenal. So again, Outstanding book. I'm excited to dive in and let's do that because I know you've got limited time here. So, you know, in the intro, Stephen, I mentioned that our culture has a warped uh, sense or idea of manhood. And you actually talk about that in the book. So unpack that a bit for us. In your eyes, what does that mean and what has it done to men? Well, men are in downward spiral. There's no question about it. By every measurable standard in this generation, from longevity to academic performance, earning power, uh, life satisfaction, men are in downward spiral. We all know that. And, uh, you know, one of the worst indicators of it is the high suicide rate among men in the Western world. Yeah. But uh, it's a result of a lot of things. Uh, I read a book by a Columbia University scholar uh, who's a female, by the way, and she says that really the decline of Western manhood, American manhood, began with theological liberalism in the 1800s, believe it or mm. not. Uh, she goes a, a long way. It's a book entitled The Feminization of America. Of course, we, we, we all know that it's continued progressively. And today you can go to university classes where masculinity is actually seen as a toxic impact upon yeah. society. So uh, the simple way that I like to illustrate it is I call it the gorilla theory of men. I speak a lot at universities and, and the kids enjoy it when I start picking on the professors uh, like this. The gorilla theory of men. We needed men in America when they were taming the frontier and they were laying the railroad tracks and they were toting that barge, lifting that bale, and raising the steel and all of that kind of thing. But when we stepped into an information society, uh, when, we, when we stepped into a society that has a lot more to do with higher thought and relationships and connection and all of that kind of thing, uh, men didn't have the aptitude for it, so we're told. So women are ascending and breaking glass ceilings and breaking records. But men are like gorillas in a cage sitting in the corner eating a banana and scratching themselves trying to figure out what's going on. Now, I personally don't believe that. But I do believe that the models that are being handed to men uh, of what manhood is, uh, is leading to their destruction. I describe in the book, as you know, idiot man and dog man. Uh, dog man's the guy hanging out at the strip club, you know, shoving 20s in some girl's underwear who's dancing around a pole. 
And Idiot Man is the guy on television we see all the time, the, the middle-aged dad doing a happy dance because he found the remote in the couch yeah. while his family's rolling their eyes. And so men are portrayed as idiots uh, or dogs. And, uh, and, I, and I would be mad at society about that, except that men have contributed to these stereotypes. Mm. Uh, you know the statistic, American University Colleges, I'm, I'm sorry, American Colleges and Universities, 20% of all women are sexually abused. Who does that? Untethered, probably unfathered, unethical, uh, men, men, young men without character. So not to rant on here, but I think we're in a crisis. I do, however, believe we can turn it around in our generation. I really do. I don't think this is something we can't turn. And I'm seeing tremendous things happen. So I'm largely positive. But yeah, we're, right now, men in this generation are in crisis. And I'm glad you're helping to bring it to the fore. Well, likewise, man. And you kind of segued into my next question there and the fact that to a certain degree, we're responsible for our own downfall, right? No, like we shouldn't no play, question about it. Yeah, we shouldn't play the role of victim. So, And you touched on that, like I said. So why is that? And why is it important for us to acknowledge that? Well, it, it's absolutely essential to acknowledge it for this for the same reason. Let me use an illustration. Let's say I'm 100 pounds overweight. Thank God I'm not. But let's say I'm 100 pounds overweight. And I blame you. I blame Mark Henderson. Yeah. Well, it means I'm not going to take responsibility. It means I'm not going to execute a plan to make a change. It means I'm not going to recognize the reality of how I got in this shape. Uh, and I'm going to sit around being bitter at you, very possibly eating and drinking more, you know, doing yeah. a bottle of whiskey at night out of my bitterness and my anger. So th the problem is that if you blame someone else, especially somebody, as in this illustration, who's not responsible in the same way that women aren't responsible for the downfall of men, uh, then you're going to sit around, make your situation worse, not come up with solutions um, and to go into a further downward spiral. Women have not taken from men anything men have not given up in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, women didn't just march into our lives and start taking jobs from us and start taking performance from us or what have you. Men allowed that to happen. Men abandoned their families. Men didn't stay in the home and raise their sons. Uh, men uh, let these things go. Men had spent more time at the strip club than they did reading a book or hanging with a band of brothers who were in intent on making them better. So I don't spend a lot of time beating on men. As I say in the book, I, you can't guilt a man to greatness. But I do have to say to men, uh, just, just enough to make the point that, uh, you know, we got ourselves in this shape. We should pause for a moment and take responsibility for that. The good news about that, if we got ourselves into this shape, we can get ourselves out of this shape. Yeah, amen. And so that's, that's, that's the issue for me. It's just, it's just good old, since I'm speaking in a Christian context here, it's just good old Christian repentance. The moment, the moment we, conviction comes and we repent, we take responsibility for what we've done, we ask forgiveness, we start seeking the help we need to rise again. Yeah. And we change our ways. That's a key part of repentance too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a powerful point. We, we are at fault, uh, to a large degree. And I think those changes have happened over a long course of time. And so when, like anything, any change that happens over a long period of time, it's, it's hard to see it when you're in it. But then when you take a step back and this book is kind of, kind of helps us do that, take a step back and you realize like, oh yeah, we, we kind of have done that to ourselves. So that's a, yes. a good and powerful reminder. The theme of this book obviously revolves around fire, and you highlight seven specific fires that ought to burn in a man's soul. Now, I know the answer to this because I've read the book, or nearly all of it, uh, but for guys who haven't read this book yet, why fire? What's so compelling about fire? Well, the best way to say it is going to sound like I'm selling books, but I'm not. I had written Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. It was a big hit. I was grateful for it. I wrote a little movement book, as I call it, called Building Your Band of Brothers, which you've already mentioned. Very grateful for the impact of those books and other books by John Eldridge and others that I really admire. But when I saw men, even who had digested those books, even who were in good men's ministries, men's groups, bands of brothers, I noticed there was something individual missing from these guys' souls. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was some uh, inner drive, inner passion. They could conform outwardly. They could enjoy their band of brothers. They could be better in a lot of ways, but there was something of an inner drive uh, and in her, you know, I would even use, have used the word fire before I formalized it um, in, a, in these men's souls. I began to think and pray and meditate on it, exactly what, what it was. What is it that, that caused these, these issues? What is it that caused this to be light? And I began to realize that even if a man is aspiring to a model of uh, a noble manhood, good man, righteous man, great man, as I call it, uh, even if he's passionate about that and he's in a group of guys wanting him to, to help, get, help get him there, Still, there are some fires on the inside that he alone can make sure are alive in his soul. And I think they're the way God made us. I think many men lack it. And so I wanted to draw them out. So when I talk about, for example, 
the fire of heritage. You can be involved. Again, I'm speaking in a Christian context like I am in a men's ministry at my church. You can be involved in that and never recover the fire of heritage that ought to burn in the soul of a righteous man. Because maybe somebody doesn't address it and nobody helps you. Nobody challenges you. Or maybe you're ashamed of your past and never bring it up. You know, you mm-hmm. have a, come from a long line of, who knows, prisoners or criminals or what have you. Um, but as I say in the book, everybody's got something in their heritage that God intended to take up residence in their soul and help fuel them to greatness. So I use the illustration of fire because the ultimate uh, purpose, the ultimate thing I'm describing in these seven things is something that ought to live inside of you and set you aflame, set you beyond passion, be almost like fire from heaven, something that causes uh, causes you to, to, to surge like all pistons are firing and something that God is involved in. So uh, as I say in the book, you know, the, 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 the engineering, the engineers tell me that fire actually isn't an element like earth and wind and, and so on. Um, but fire is what happens when elements change. So I'm wanting guys to make a change that ignites their hearts uh, so that they've got this, this full speed ahead drive and fire on the inside of them that helps them live righteous lives. I love that that uh, comparison to fire. Flipping through <laughs> through this book, there's there's several pages where there's more yellow than there is white because I've highlighted <laughs> I've highlighted so much, and that was one of the, the the comments in the book that really jumped out at me. Um, I think that there's obviously always going to be room for guys to improve when it comes to you know mastering each of the seven fires that you mentioned in the book, but. Uh, one area that really impacted me the most, the one that had me thinking, you know, man, I've really got a lot of work to do in this area was the fire of battle and how to harness a quote unquote warrior spirit. Now I often speak about the spiritual battles that men face because I think spiritual warfare is a very real thing, but I know that there are probably people out there, maybe even listening now who might hear the words like battle and warrior and attribute them to toxic masculinity. So explain what you mean by warrior spirit and how that might make the uh, world, the world that we live in today in particular, a safer place. Sure. Yeah. I'm not primarily speaking of physical battle when I'm taking, talking about the warrior spirit. I, I certainly think a man should be able to handle himself and depending on what context he is, you know, he wants to be able to protect his family and protect himself and what have you. But I believe that bound up in noble manhood is, has to be the ability to fight the invisible battles that need to be fought uh, for himself and others. And so the kind of battle that I'm talking about is a man man battling for mastery over himself, a man battling for the well-being of his family in terms of encouragement, in terms of words, in terms of prayer, in terms of support, in in terms of coaching, in terms of provision, et cetera. I'm talking about the way a man stands with another man when when his friend's battling depression or, or going through a tough time in a marriage or like my earlier illustration, you know, he's gained too much weight. Now he's got to battle back to his, you know, speedo size. Uh, this is this is the stuff that I've, I'm talking about. So it's 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 how you declare war on the invisible forces that destroy noble manhood. Um, you know, I've got a band of brothers I'm very committed to. Um, guys in the past, not so much now. Uh, a couple of my guys come out of the NFL and they they just had women thrown at them all the time. So they battled lust issues. They wanted to love their wives and be and be faithful, but they just, you know, they're good looking, hunky NFL, ex NFL guys, and they had to battle the, the, the fight the battle to, you know, to be, keep it pure. Well, that's an invisible battle. And they asked us, they asked the rest of the band of brothers to stand with them. So we prayed, we encouraged, we held accountable, we traveled with, we put practical things in place, we made sure he had a lot of romantic time with his wife, we'd spend time with the kids, you know, things like that. These are all part of the battle. Uh, me battling over myself, coronavirus. We're all, you know, quarantined in our home almost. Well, uh, how are you going to stay in shape? How are you going to keep yourself uh, equal to the task? So I, I, I work on body weight exercises and I tame my eating. I, I get my guys to hold me accountable and I get my wife to, you know, maybe make healthier meals than what I really want secretly and so on and so on. Um, but then it's also all the spiritual things that we can talk about. And, and I, I certainly am committed to radically with my life, prayer and fasting and intercession and spiritual warfare. You're committed to a band of brothers. It's very likely you'll be up all night one night alone at your house, interceding for a guy who's sound asleep across town, but there's a spiritual battle going on over his life. So the problem is that we not only don't teach the martial side, the warrior side of our faith often in our churches, but also this generation is far removed from military culture. And I'm kind of glad about that. It means we've had a lot of peace, 
But I grew up in the home of an army officer. I grew up in the home of a special forces uh, warrior. And I lived on military bases my whole life. And my life has been dramatically enhanced by being close to military culture. I speak a lot to the military today. I lecture at West Point in the Naval Academy. So I'm near military culture. And it does nothing but make me a better man. Not, I mean, I mean I'm 62. It's not like I'm you know, going out there and trying to run against those guys or beat them on the football field. But just being around the honor and the heritage and the devotion and the pursuit of excellence and the, and the preparing of yourself to fight battles for, for people who are maybe even not your own, uh, that all makes me better. So uh, I think we've got to recover this. That's why I put seven prayers of a warrior in the chapter and urge men to, to pay attention and read a little bit more about military affairs. And then, of course, go to scripture to really master those, those, the art of spiritual warfare, which I think is essential to Christian manhood. Yeah, I would agree. I really appreciated those prayers that you included because I like practical takeaways. And that was just like, boom, something I can plug right into my life like today and take steps forward. Good. And guys listening, do not underestimate these battles, even if they're seemingly insignificant. You mentioned them, Stephen, but the little things like, oh, I'll watch one more episode of this show on Netflix, or I'll just have you know two or three more of these delicious cookies little things that chip away at the life, the greater life that God wants you to have, they add up over time. And I, I that's been true in my life. And I know it's, uh, it's a real thing for a lot of guys out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, we, we've got to begin to see our lives in terms of those battles. I don't want a guy to be nervous and battle oriented all the time. I want him to have rest and peace, but you don't have rest and peace until the other side of the battle. We don't have rest and peace and this generation until the other side of the of World War II, you know, the other side of battles that have threatened our peace, the other side of the American Revolution. So you want you want real peace in your life, get to the other win win the battles you're meant to meant to fight. And I see my relationship with my wife not so much in terms of battle, but I certainly have to battle for her in that relationship. When mm-hmm. a man thinks that way, um, then he, he becomes I think he starts becoming the man he's made to be. Oh yeah. And it, like you said, it applies to every corner, every aspect of our lives. And yes. I think that when we overcome through battle, we find a sense of purpose, right? Yeah. That, that, that's, that's what happens to me. And I, I'm encouraging it in other men. Um, I love happy warriors. I love my guys who, when I say we got a, we got a battle here, they get a smile on their face and they're, they're, they're they got mud on their face and they're right. maybe they're bleeding on their knees and they're, they're dripping sweat. But man, this is what they were made for. They can't wait. And they also know there's going to be a great party on the other side. You know, like some guys just battle hard because, hey, we win this thing. Uh, we're off to Morton's or whatever. You know, we're, <laughs> we're off to Burger King or we're off to, you know, hit Joe's house for those great steaks. Or I'm just playing, but you understand my point. Yep, it's yep. the idea that celebrating victory on the other side is part of what men are made for. So, yeah, you, 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 you get it, step into the battle. Uh, you begin to find out whole parts of yourself. In fact, I, I'm convinced that's one of the great benefits of sports when we're younger. Yeah, uh, I realize not everybody's an athlete. And I'm certainly not picking on them. I've got young men in my family who are both great athletes and others are great thinkers and great chemists and great, you know, whatever, musicians. But not everybody has to be a great athlete. But, but I think every young person uh, and every older person should be pursuing some physical goal in their life because it awakens things inside of you. 100%. My 90-some-year-old friend who does mall walking every day, he's trying to ba- break a barrier every day, and it keeps things alive in his soul and makes him a better man because he's pushing and battling and fighting. And he'll call me and talk smack like he just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, and we have bets going, like, like humorous little bets. Like, I bet that I can do more push, I can increase my push-ups a greater percentage than you can walk that dang mall with Susie Q. <laughs> and of course, he's like 90-something. He's just giving me all kinds of smack. But you understand what's happening. We're keeping our souls alive. We're keeping the pistons firing. We're keeping the muscles building. We're, we're being what it means to be a man. And I think it's absolutely vital for every man's soul. Absolutely. And uh, we never get too old to set goals and work towards something and, and um, fight those fights to, to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. Absolutely. Yeah. In chapter three on the fire of destiny, uh, you write about serving the season you're in. I think this is such a key point, especially for younger guys who might be expecting things to come to fruition sooner um, than later. But explain what serving the season you're in has looked like for you in your life. Yeah, I'm happy to. Let, let Let me just sound like I'm bragging just for a moment to make the point. Uh, I'm often introduced as you introduce me. I'm a fo- commentator for Fox and CNN. Uh, I am a New York Times bestselling author. 
I've won awards for things. I've visible started companies, uh, advise in DC, welcomed in the White House. Okay, there's there's the billing on Stephen Mansfield. Not bad. <laughs> okay, and I, the only reason I'm doing that is not to brag, but to say this, because it, it's easy to say that. And that's said of me all the time whenever I'm introduced. I have mown yards to get through college. I have worked at a pizza place. I have cleaned out chicken poop with shovels all day long. Um, I have worked in a moving service where I carried stuff all day in hundred degree heat. Um, I have had seasons of being prominent now, but most of my life has been in hidden ways, working behind the scenes, learning the skills, working, you know, I, I pastored a church in Nashville eventually that was thousands, but I started in a church of 16 people in West Texas. Um, you know, my point in all of this is you don't get to success or fame or whatever it is you're called to uh, just overnight. You get better in life at whatever it is you're made to do by going through stages. And each one of those stages uh, has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. So I worked my way through college and then I worked at a little church out in West Texas for 10 years. I worked at a small church in West Texas uh, started by my in-laws and, uh, and then I, I, like I say, I've worked at pizza places. I've cleaned out chicken poop. I've, I've done things for which I wasn't qualified, had to learn, made mistakes. You want to serve whatever season you're in. God has your life and he's taking you in a path towards whatever it is you're meant to have impact in or whatever you're meant to do as part of your calling. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you'll have to work at McDonald's. You'll have to mow yards. You'll have to work your way through college. You'll have to take classes in college that you aren't all that you know good at. You'll have to do jobs where you, you you don't soar initially. You'll have difficult bosses. You'll have times when maybe your 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 body's not quite cooperating with what the challenges are, etc., etc., etc. The issue is not just to be bitter because you have to work at McDonald's, not just to be bitter because you want to be the CEO but you're working in the mailroom, uh, not just to be bitter because you're sitting the bench or whatever. But, but understand that that's a season of your life that is essential to all your future, future success. So throw yourself into the battle. Throw yourself into the challenge. Mm -hmm. Throw yourself into mastering the, the, the skills that you need to rise out of that season and move to another season. And so well, one of the things that bugs me a little bit in American culture is we're always talking about people, uh, you know, famous people and well-known people and authors and what have you, at, at the end of their life. We're always talking about them later on. Uh, when they are, you know, somewhat successful. So every kid comes out and goes, well, man, I'll never get there. But, but then I know a lot of these famous people. And so I, I know their stories. I know that they failed and were in hospitals for years and, you know, suffered and fathers, um, one of my best friends, very, very famous man's father killed himself. This kid went through depression for years and years and years. We don't talk enough about the battle to get to greatness. We just act like greatness happens five seconds after leaving the womb. Yeah. And it's not true. So I love talking about the hard things that I've been through. Uh, I love talking about the difficulties in my family. I love talking about having a, a war hero as a father, but a father who was very distant. He wasn't as warm and loving as, as other fathers can tend to be. I love him and I honor him and we were close at the end. But when I was growing up, it was hard. I love talking about that because it's an encouragement to young guys who uh, are looking at where they are and going, man, I'll never accomplish anything. I'm stuck here at Burger King for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. So that's, I appreciate you asking the question because I think it's one of the essential parts of being a, a human being of any impact, but much less being a man. Yeah. And I don't think it's a coincidence that achieving that warrior spirit is almost a prerequisite to finding uh, success in the seasons of our lives to, to battling through those seasons and, and, um, plowing through those difficult times to achieve the, the, the prominence that we all kind of have in mind for our lives. Exactly. Let's dive into friendships here, keeping things moving. Um, you know, when we talk about friendships, I personally, just through observation of in my own life, I think there's a lot of guys out there whose friendships with other men are kind of like rivers that are a mile wide and an inch deep, right? Too many men lack a deep, meaningful bonds with other men. So why are friendships so crucial and how do you recommend that guys go about building deep relationships? Well, the capacity for friendship is one of the great gifts of being a man. And men are by nature team oriented, tribal oriented. They need other men around them. I'll tell this real, real quickly and humorously, but I, not long ago, 
a friend of mine showed me a picture uh, that was taken at a party. And I looked at it and I said, who's that? He said, it's you, fool. I was sitting uh, at a, on a couch uh, with, the, with the t-shirt on. It just happened to be the t-shirt was stretched over my stomach. I had just put about 19 Oreos in my mouth. <laughs> I hadn't been having any alcohol at all, but my, I was halfway through a blink, so I looked like I was drunk. I looked jowly. The picture was over over overexposed, so I looked pasty. It was the worst picture of a human being that I have ever seen. <laughs> and I got to thinking later, if I can look that way physically, because I'd never seen myself looking that way before, uh, and not know it, what 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 uh, what am I likely to be like on the inside that I'm not aware of? My mm -hmm. friends around me see me in 3D. They know who I am. They know what my motivations are. They know what my weaknesses tend to be. They can hear the bitterness or tension in my voice. They can. They know when I'm weary and about to give up. I mean, it's. They have eyes on me that I don't have. So a man, in order to accomplish his best, uh, needs to have other men around him. Needs needs to have a band of brothers. And I've of course written about that a great deal. And I I believe, of course, you can always go and join a pre-existing group of guys at a men's ministry or you know some kind of group or or program. Um, but I think every man's got to have a band of brothers around him uh, and him be part of a band of brothers around other men. And, the, and, the, and the, the art of this thing is that you learn how to have the indirect connection. Uh, this is something I talk about in, in the book, and it's something I talk about in, in every time I, I can to teach men. Uh, our fathers didn't teach us how to build friendships. Uh, most of us, most of the previous generation never taught us about how to build friendships. But they do experiments with little boys and little girls, and little girls uh, sit there in these rooms with the with the researchers looking through two-way mirrors, and uh, the the little girls inevitably size each other up. They'll they'll eventually turn two chairs facing each other, look at each other, and one of them will say, "I like your hair." And from that moment on, they are best friends forever. I mean, they can chatter away and have a great time because girls relate that way. The little boys, when they when the researchers watch them, they inevitably turn the chairs side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and start talking about things they're going to do together. Hey, I bet I can beat you to that tree. Hey, I bet we can get Tommy to pull us in that wagon. Hey, I bet we can set that door on fire. And that's how men bond. Men don't bond face to face. You know as well as I do, one of the dumbest things you can do is put a bunch of guys in a circle in the fellowship hall and, and then somebody say, hey, Bob, tell us how you're feeling today. Yeah. They, none of those guys will be back the next week. That is not how men relate. Men relate while they're playing softball. They relate while they're putting the roof on the widow's house. They relate while they're mowing the grass of the older couple. They relate while they're you know, doing other things, grilling up meat, talking smack during the game. So the art of building friendships is to create indirect connections for men to connect with you and each other. And then as you get down the road on that process, you can start talking to them and saying, you know, I've been reading a good book on manhood. What, what, what did your dad ever teach you about men? And you start realizing before long who the people are who are interested in talking about those things. What you're trying to get to in your circle of men, which I call a band of brothers, you're trying to get to what I call a free fire zone. It means that anything that needs to be said to make me better, anything that needs to be said to make you better will be said. And, you, and the coaching and the commitment follow up. So if Mark, you and I are a band of brothers and you notice that I just got atrocious language or my manners are terrible or I, you hear that bitter, angry cell phone call to my wife or you know, one glass of wine uh, at, at a dinner turns into six or whatever it is, um, you're going to say something. Nobody's going to be sitting around wringing their hands wondering, gosh, I hope somebody talks to Stephen. You step in. You say what needs to be said. We're in a free fire zone. We're committed to each other. And then you help coach me out of whatever's about to capture my soul. So that's that to me in a nutshell is what we've got to reclaim. We got to stop this stay, hanging, hanging back from each other and saying, man, I hope somebody talks to him because he's, he's heading for trouble and be committed to each other and coach each other and have that free fire zone where anything that needs to be addressed to make us better is addressed. Yeah, that's good stuff. And I think that the more we can develop a level of spiritual maturity, the more we'll get out of those relationships too, because the more spiritually mature we are, we'll find ourselves being more uh, equipped to deliver some of that feedback to our friends and we'll be better equipped to handle that feedback because we know where it's coming from, right? We know where, where their heart lies. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So on that note of relationships, you know, that I think the most important relationship that we can have is our relationship with God. And at the onset of every show, uh, of this show anyway, I say this podcast and the entire platform of the Inspired Legacy seeks to equip and inspire men to be bold and be the best men that they can be for their family. But 
as often as I can, I try to do that through the lens of biblical wisdom and spiritual growth and development. So God, whether listeners believe in him or have a relationship with him or not, uh, God plays a big role in everything that I do here. Now, I do think that you can be a good man without believing in God, but I also think that you can be an even better one if you do. So Stephen, I'm curious, how has your relationship with God changed or maybe informed the way you think about manhood and masculinity? Well, it, it transformed everything. I mean, I obviously was a man before I became a Christian, but when I began to understand that God made manhood, that I that God is not mad at me for being a man. Uh, God is not mad at me because I have a penis or because I have hungers or because I have drives uh, or I think a certain way. God made me this way. And what is good and true and noble manhood, in other words, the way I'm meant to function, is something that God ordained and he's going to help me get to it. So rather than seeing God in kind of an immature way, uh, as I used to, as maybe uh, you know opposing everything it means to be a man, I began to realize that God was trying to clean up and purify and extend everything it means to be a man in my life, and uh, He created it. It's like it's like turning to the scientists that, or you know the engineers at Ford to figure out how to Ford runs. You know when your car goes, that's exactly what we ought to be doing. So having the power of His Spirit, having His Word, uh, having Jesus as an example. Having the work of God in my life has absolutely transformed what noble manhood is. And so all the things that I, I love to do as a man, to strain, to work against boundaries, to stand guard, to celebrate victories, to bond with a band of, of, of men, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what it means uh, to be a man. This is all the way God created it. And so I'm really, I'm really thrilled uh, that... that uh, to talk to men about the fact that, you know, God didn't make you a man and then start sitting around being mad at you about it. God's trying to help you be a glorious man, a great man, a righteous man. And uh, that, that has been absolutely transforming. And as I, as I began to understand also, I have a background in biblical studies and a couple of degrees. And, and as I began to understand uh, Jesus more in terms of the original historical context and who he was and what he endured, what he experienced, I just saw him as the man's man, as the ultimate ideal of a man, not just because he's the son of God, though, of course, because he is, uh, but, but also because he, he was incarnated. He came as the son of man, not just the son of God. Uh, a, ma a man uh, walked this earth. A man uh, ate. Uh, Jesus looked up and saw women and said, okay, that's what lust feels like. And that's why he's sitting at the right hand of God, the father, uh, telling, interceding for us, advocating for us and saying, father, here's what it's like to be a man. And here's what these guys are going to need to, to get past this trap of sex and lust in their culture. And here's what these guys are going to need to bond together in a lonely, isolated culture. And here's what these guys are going to need to rescue their children from the swamp of their generation, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I, I'm just, it, it's, it has, to answer your question, uh, being a believer and walking with God has absolutely transformed my entire understanding of manhood and how I should walk in it. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think I've heard you make that point elsewhere too, that Jesus was, he's not the, the softy that we see portrayed in popular culture. He was a, he was not just a guy, he was a dude. I and mean, when you think about what he did physically, I mean, they walked miles and miles in barely sandals, right? Oh, it, 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 it's unbelievable when you really look at Jesus' life in the, in, the, in, the, in the terms of the original story and not just kind of see him as a guy in a bathrobe with a sheep under his arm, like a lot of our church art. You know, Jesus was hunted by people who wanted to kill him every day of his life. Right. So that's why his parents had to get up and go to Egypt when he was born, because somebody was trying to kill Jesus. Uh, Jesus grew up among mountain folks, among hillbillies, basically. Uh, that's what folks in Galilee were, mountain folks. You're absolutely right. You know, we read in our Bible, and he walked to Jerusalem. We think that took 20 minutes. It took days yeah. to, walk, to walk these distances, and he walked them all the time. Uh, we know that he was a carpenter, but the word carpenter in the original language means also stonemason. You didn't have these massive cities, so you didn't have that kind of specialization. So the same guy who crafted a table crafted a tombstone. Mm -hmm. So Jesus at 13, 14 years old is hauling around big stones and chopping trees and hammering things. He was buff. And then, by the way, he hung out with you know, 12 disciples, for heaven's sakes. These were fishermen. These are rough guys. Yeah. You know, this isn't like the Harvard Debating Society or something. These guys throwing each other in the water, farting, belching, <laughs> carrying on, laughing. I mean, Jesus went and got real men. Yeah. He got fishermen. Don't you know they laughed and joked about everything? Um, and sure, he discipled them, and sure, he taught them, but he didn't cast out their masculinity. Um, and then I could go on and on and on with what he endured. 
you know, it takes a man, it takes somebody gutsy to male or female, by the way, to fast for 40 days in the wilderness, you know, um, it takes, it takes somebody gutsy to know, to, to love a guy and your band of brothers that, that, you know, is going to betray you. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, but still loved him, still hung with him. Uh, so it's not just the last week of Jesus life where he endured tough physical and spiritual things. It was his whole life. And yet he went through all of it, went through all of it perfectly. And this is what excites me. That same man is sitting at the right hand of God right now. And again, the two theological words, our advocate, our intercessor, uh, he's basically saying, help Mark, help Mark Henderson. Here's what he needs. Here's what that feels like. Here's what it feels like to eat too many Oreos. Here's what it feels like to, to want to do this or to want to do that or want to do the other thing. Um, give him grace. Here's the kind of grace he needs. He's actually telling the father and, 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 and issuing commands to help us in our manhood uh, that, that he understands because he's walked in the skin of a man and he's still a man sitting at the right hand of God, a man with scars, a man who remembers what it was like. Uh, that thrills me. That just thrills me. Yeah. Yeah. He for sure was a manly man, man's man. And, um, all throughout the text, you know, if you learn to read between the lines, uh, reflection of masculinity and what it means to be a man is sprinkled throughout the Bible, and especially in the life of Jesus, like you mentioned, well, Stephen, I know we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, I always like to leave guys with practical takeaways. Uh, in the book, you touch on a particular ritual that you recommend men walk through together to dedicate themselves to igniting these seven fires that are in the book, igniting these fires in their souls. So could you just briefly touch on that ritual a bit for the guys listening? Absolutely. I believe that rituals are important. We see them in everything from the military to the Boy Scouts. To men, men just evolve rituals. I've got a little blonde-haired three-year-old grandson. We do something one week, and the next week he comes back and goes, okay, let's do that thing the way we did last week. And so even at three years old, he's got, the, he's got this masculine ritual thing down. Um, I put a ritual at the back of the book in a little, little chapter, short chapter at the end. When guys have read the book, uh, I'm asking them to gather with other men and somehow have seven fires. It can be a candle. Uh, it can be a can of Sterno. It can be a bond, seven bonfires in the woods, whatever. Just don't burn the place down. And do a little ritual. Um, we're not doing anything occult. I'm not asking you to ask that the fire jump into your soul or some kind of wacko witchcraft thing like that. But each of those fires represents the seven things that I've talked about in the book. Friendship, heritage, legacy, God, all that kind of thing. And so stand in front of these fires and commit yourself to see those things reawakened. I don't care, for example... If you come from a long line of just evil people, something in your family line is meant to take up residence in you, not just in your own biological family line, but your ethnicity, your people group, your nation. There are elements of those stories and those histories that are meant to live in your soul and set your soul aflame, so to speak. So stand in front of a fire, maybe it's even labeled heritage, um, and you know, ask God to, to give you the grace uh, to awaken that and commit yourself to it. Then move to the next fire. You know, all the, all the, all the seven fires that we're talking about, legacy and, and heritage and love and friendship and all of it, and commit to those seven fires and have other men pray for you. And then, of course, when all that's done, a whole bunch of animals need to be sacrificed and there needs to be a lot of eating. But my point is that I believe in rituals. I believe rituals seal things. Um, I believe that rituals are important for men. And so um, I finally decided that I would just at the, at the back of one of my books, uh, actually recommend the ritual I wanted to see men do. And men are already starting to do it. There are already conferences uh, in this country where men are starting to do that, that little seven fire ritual there at the end of the book. And I'm thrilled with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think rituals help us help cement in our minds, the memory of, of uh, an important decision or an important moment in our life. So I think that's, that's, uh, I haven't got to that part of the book yet, but I'm excited to read it. Well, get off the air, get off the podcast and get to it. What's wrong with you? No, I'm just playing. I so appreciate you doing it. Uh, well, Stephen, last question. Um, I know you got to run, but you know you directly talk about legacy in your book, and I want to give you a chance to touch on that as it pertains to the book. But my question for you is, and it's a question I ask all of my guests, is what is your, we all have a standard definition of legacy, but what is your definition of an inspired legacy? Yeah, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, I have a very personal approach to this, and I'll describe it. Um, I want to live in such a way that when future generations, especially in my family line, but, 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 but outside of my family line, even just think about me, there is a meaning and a nobility that radiates into their lives. So 
one of my heroes, as you as you'll know if you've read anything I've written, uh, which you have, um, is Winston Churchill. If I'm just walking down the road and I just let him flash through my brain, I'm a little bit better man. I, I've read everything he's written. I've written books about him. I lecture on him all over the world. I, I'm committed to him. I've got his picture and his signature and every kind of thing in my office. Uh, he inspires me. All I have to do is just think about him, his example, his fortitude, his devotion, the battles he won, and I'm a better man. Well, that's what I want. Uh, for me, the legacy takes a lot of forms. It can be financial instruments and buildings and all kinds of things. But, but in my life, given that what I do is very personal, I stand on stage, I talk to people, I get on television, I meet with guys. What I want when I'm gone from this world, which is what really what a legacy is all about, is that I have embedded things in people's lives and lived such a life uh, that just the remembrance of me in a man's mind or especially my son and my daughter, I have, I have one of each, I have my grandchildren, et cetera, inspires further nobility in them. That they just remember who I was. They remember what I stood for. They remember what I was committed to. They remember how I treated them. Yes, maybe they remember what I've left them materially. That's fine. But what it all does is it awakens and, and inspires and sets to flame uh, a greater nobility, a greater godliness, uh, a greater devotion to purpose and calling and destiny than perhaps was there before they thought of me. And that's that's what I want. It's how I feel about Lincoln. It's how I feel about Churchill. It's how I feel about Jesus. It's how I feel about others from history. Just the thought of them makes me a better man. And mm. so that's, that's what I want. So good, man. So good. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. I know you got to run. Uh, please let everybody know where they can find the book, but let people know where they can follow you online to stay plugged into what is coming next. Absolutely. You can follow me personally at stephenmansfield.tv. Uh, that's my website. All of my personal uh, social media is Mansfield Writes, my last name and then W-R-I-T-E-S. But for men, we've got greatman.tv, a website, Great Man Podcast, which is rocking, uh, and also uh, a lot of programs and books and training and all kinds of things on there. So go to greatman.tv and you'll find out about all that stuff. You got it, man. Stephen, thanks again. Hey, great to be with you, buddy. Thank you so much. Yeah, so many great takeaways there. Guys, thanks again for listening. And again, if you got anything out of today's message, remember to subscribe, leave a review, and share our message because when we work together to lift up fatherhood, we're going to change the world one dad at a time. Until next time, live inspired. Live inspired.